So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for this webinar. It's wonderful to see so many of you. As the December the 31st deadline approaches, businesses of all sizes uh, need to start making important preparations for life at the end of the transition. Uh, we're less than three months to go. Time's running out to prepare for life outside the EU. The good news is, is that there's plenty of support available with the transition to a new relationship with the EU. While the final form of that has still been established in negotiations, there's uh, important preparations that all businesses should be making. And to help you through this process, the Chamber, in association with our colleagues at Enterprise in Barnsley, uh, we're going to be beginning a uh, Brexit contingency programme to explain support and offer guidance over the next six months. So here to take you through the first webinar of the series is Jay Mazoulis of Export and Import Consultancy Services, who's our resident international trade advisor and specialist. Over to you, Jane. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Shane. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Jane Zoulis and I'm going to take you through the um, contingency planning um, for the uh, 1st of January. Um, just give, give you a little bit of information about my background so you know who I am. Um, I'm a graduate member of the Institute of Export and I've spent the majority of my career working in international trade. Um, I've been a freelance international trade advisor for the past 16 years and as Shane has already mentioned, I do uh, the training for Barnsley and Rotherham Chamber of Commerce, the international trade training. Um, I also offer bespoke training, outsource documentation services and mentoring services for those companies that um, are looking to export but don't know where to start. Um, the webinar is an hour and a half. Um, I'm aiming to speak for about an hour um, and then there's half an hour towards the end where everybody can ask questions, so please, Make a note of your questions, or if there's something really burning as we're going through, uh, just put your hand up and um, Shane will try and let you in to ask the question. Um, our agenda today, um, obviously, because we've only got an hour and a half, uh, time is of the essence, so it's going to be a broad brush approach, um, hoping to cover all the um, high points, if you like, but there's not going to be enough time to go into lots of detail behind. Um, it should, however, be enough for you to be able to take back to your businesses and to look at your systems and procedures and see where you might need to be making some sort of plans. Um, there are a lot of areas around um, Brexit, legal, um, trade, transit, all this sort of thing. I'm going to concentrate mainly on the movement of goods because that's the area that I'm most experienced in. Uh, and in order to do this, we'll have a look at um, how the EU was for us before we left, uh, just to give us the context of what we're leaving to what we're going to. And then we'll take a look at what um, a hard Brexit um, is going to look like for exporters and UK exporters and importers. And just for good measure towards the end, we'll um, throw in the free trade deal, the, the potential free trade deal. And finally, um, a takeaway list effectively of the sort of things you should be checking in your own businesses. Um, before we do kick off um, officially, if you like, I just want to take you through some terminology. Forgive me, those of you who know all this already, uh, but I just want it want everybody to understand what we're talking about uh, as we're going through. So free trade agreements being bandied around an awful lot on the news recently, but effectively it's where two or more countries um, make a deal to abolish, to reduce or abolish tariffs uh, and non-tariff restrictions between their countries, making it easier effectively to trade um, between each other. Um, a customs union, again, you'll have heard a lot about this with the EU, that effectively is a free trade area where there's a, a common external um, tariff put in place for all the member countries. So with the EU at the moment, for example, every EU member state, um, if they import something into their country, um, the same rate of duty will be charged in Italy as it is in France, as it is in Germany, as it is at the moment in the UK. So that's effectively what a customs union is. We all have the same import duty that we levy on goods coming in from the rest of the world. Single market, again, this is a real hot spot. Um, and I'm sure most of you by now will know what the hell that is. It's basically an enhanced free trade area where there are four freedoms um, allowed. So that's freedom of movement of goods, services, people, and investment. Passporting rights, um, for those of you who might be in the service industry, 
um, that's uh, the ability of financial services um, sectors to offer their services within the EU without needing any further authorization in each individual country. Um, as we as a country um, export 37% of our services, financial services, to the EU, it's a, it's a really important point uh, for the free trade negotiations that our government's doing at the moment. And a tariff, also known as a customs duty, is basically a state tax levied when goods move from one territory to another. So if you were importing, for example, from America, you would expect to be paying um, a, a, a duty or a tariff when goods arrive here in the UK. And a third country, strange concept really, but basically all it means is that if you're a third country, you're a country that's outside of the EU, you're not a member state. And effectively, come the 31st of December, we will be a third country, regardless of whether we have a free trade agreement or not. Um, so this is the, a, a, the broad uh, list, checklist, if you like. We're going to have a look at the um, areas there, the issues there. I'm not going to go into any great detail on um, staffing and existing contracts because that's not my uh, area of expertise. I will just say quickly that if you do employ EU nationals who you want to keep, um, you want to make sure that they've um, already registered um, for rights of residency. They need to um, register with the EU settlement program. Um, if you've got nationals that haven't, EU nationals that haven't already done that, it's not too late. You can do it before the end of this year. And um, generally, if they've been resident in this country for five years, they will get an automatic right to residency, provided they've not done anything illegal, obviously. And for those nationals who haven't already lived uh, for five years in this country, they can pre-register uh, before the 31st of December. And then to get that residency right, they've got to stay with us for five years from that point. Um, if you've got any existing contracts um, in place with either EU suppliers, if you're importers, or your EU buyers, if you're an exporter, you might want to have a look at those because you may well have made mention of EU law. Um, and from the 31st of December, you may want to revert to UK law. But again, that's not my area of exp expertise, but it's, it's just a heads up up there. And if it's very complex, you'll, you'll need to uh, get in touch with a, uh, a solicitor. And then the rest, tariffs, customs procedures, etc. we're going to take in turn uh, as we go through the webinar. Okay, let's kick off with some context. Um, so what were the advantages of being an EU member? I mean, effectively we have left, we're just now in a transition period. Um, and whether you voted to stay or to leave, there are some acknowledged positives of being in the EU and these, these are they. Basically, the, it was termed as frictionless trade. And basically that means that it should be as easy to sell and buy to and from the EU as it is to sell down the road to Birmingham. So there was minimal paperwork required. Basically, all you did was register with HMRC and get an EORI number. Um, by the way, if you haven't got an EORI number already, do apply for one. It's free of charge. You can email um, HMRC and basically within two or three days, you've got an EORI number. Um, yeah, so you've minimal paperwork, you got an EORI number, you received an order, packed it up, got a haulier um, to send it across to the EU, possibly with a delivery note, and then you'd follow it up with an invoice. The only other thing that you might have been required to do is submit an interest at report, um, and that was when you traded with any EU member state um, over the threshold of £250,000. Um, there was no need, or still isn't at the moment, any need to uh, prove regulatory compliance um, because we've got a common uh, product health, safety and uh, technical standard framework with the EU at the moment. Um, I know there's a lot of bad press about um, uh, the difficulties of trading with the EU. I think maybe you would all probably agree with me that as an exporter or an importer, the actual process is very simple. There are agencies behind the scene trying to make it all a level playing field so that goods can move freely between us. Um, there were no border controls. Um, as there was no commercial paperwork or customs paperwork to, to check or any compliance 
standards to check, no tariff to calculate, therefore there were no border controls. Occasionally you would get a security border control, obviously to um, stop any sort of smuggling. And um, something that a lot of people didn't realise was that as a, an EU member, we had access to uh, free trade agreements with over 60 countries worldwide. So that's where we're starting from. That's what we're leaving. And um, the next um, three quarters of an hour, we'll be looking at what changes there will be and what you will need to do um, in order to be able to um, negotiate this um, period as, as easily as possible. So what will Brexit actually mean? Um, on the 1st of January 2021, we'll be um, definitely out. Um, there are some definite um, things that are going to happen and some possible. So the definites for sure you can be preparing for here and now. There is definitely going to be more documentation that you need to provide, uh, whether or not we have a free trade agreement. So don't hang your hat on thinking we don't need to do anything yet, because if we've got a free trade agreement, we won't need to present any documentation. That is not true. Um, you will still need to do um, extra documentation. In fact, a free trade agreement brings with it actually more documentation. So um, we'll just put that to one side. From the 1st of January, an import and export declaration will be needed. Um, so if you're selling to the EU before the goods leave the country, um, an export declaration will have to be submitted. If you're buying from the EU, when the goods arrive in this country, um, an import declaration will need to be submitted to HMRC. Uh, because of that, you'll need an HS tariff code. Uh, again, lots of you might already know what an HS tariff code is or a customs commodity code, it's also known as. But basically for every product type that you sell or buy in, there's a specific HS tariff code. We'll look at that in a little bit more detail um, as we go on. And um, because we'll no longer be part of this um, regulatory um, level playing field, there will be um, compliance certification required uh, and board checks, not for every single export or every single import. HMRC have never checked everything coming in and going out. So is a selection of um, exports and imports, but there will be um, certification checks and you'll need to provide supporting documentation for that. If your products are controlled item, uh, that means uh, the government likes to keep an eye on where those products are going. You may well need an import license, um, especially for things like um, animal products, medical devices, anything that has any sort of um, impact on, on health. Um, and you may well need an export license if your product is a military product or it could be used to make military products. Um, I don't expect that to come in in the short term because we are, um, you know, part of all sorts of uh, military agreements with the EU. I, I don't see that being cut off immediately on the 1st of January. Um, as far as possible things that might happen after the 1st of January, if we don't have a free trade agreement in place by then, duty will be charged on goods, um, your goods going into the EU, and duty will be charged on um, goods coming from the EU into the UK. And we would have no further access to those free trade agreements that we already have access to. That being said, our government's working really hard to roll over as many of those free trade agreements as possible. Um, I think they've rolled over 20 odd uh, at the moment. And obviously in the background, they're working hard to roll over the rest. And if we do get a free trade agreement with the EU, and it, it is looking hopeful, um, you may have heard on the news recently, that um, following a telephone call with the negotiator, because both sides feel as though we're getting very close to a free trade agreement, the negotiation period has been extended by a month. So it is hopeful that we're gonna have a free trade agreement in place. Right then, we talked about documentation and what you might need. Um, and the one uh, linchpin document in all of this is the customs entry. This is the King document. Um, it's integral to meeting uh, all the requirements of goods um, being allowed to enter a country. So information on this particular document um, allows the customs authority and the import country to make sure that the goods do meet uh, 
specific regulations, that they do meet a particular customs procedure and that the correct amount of duty and VAT is being charged. So it gives an overview of that shipment, where it's from, uh, who it's going to, what the origin is, what it's worth. And the whole point around it basically is to, to be able to charge and collect import duty and to make sure that health and safety uh, conditions have been met in the importing country. Who can raise that customs entry? Well, you can, you can as, a, as a, an importer or an exporter. I will say it's a complex document. I think in my career, I've done two um, and they took me hours. That's not to say you can't learn to do it. Obviously, it's one of those things that the more you do, the easier it becomes. But you would require software because you have to uh, liaise directly with HMRC's um, customs entry system. Um, if you decide you don't want to do that, and I wouldn't blame you, I'll be honest, uh, your freight forwarder uh, can do um, the customs entries for you. I would again give you a heads up here, just make sure that that freight forwarder or your haulier can actually do them. They know how to do them, they've got the software. I know a lot of companies have only been trading with the EU that don't trade with the rest of the world. Uh, they've probably just used a haulier, a local haulier that's been able to go into the EU. Um, going forward, they will need to understand and be able to submit these um, export and import declarations. If they can do, if they've got the, the capability to do them, also check the capacity to. I've got um, a client I'm working with at the moment um, and we've been checking that their freight forwarders are on board. And although one of their freight forwarders have got the, cap the capability to do so, they just haven't got the staff to do so. So don't be complacent. Don't think, oh yeah, my freight forwarder will be able to do it for me. When you think that every day 10,000 lorries come through the port of Dover alone, and those 10,000 lorries didn't used to have to have an entry done, and now those 10,000 lorries do have to have an entry done, and of course, on those lorries, there are different exporters and imports, not just to one particular um, importer It's coming. You'll understand there's an awful lot of extra work to be done. So do make sure they've got the capacity to do it for you. Failing that, you can um, contract with a customs agent to um, direct with the customs agents. These people are usually at ports or airports, and they are authorised to um, submit customs entries for people. Again, uh, we didn't used to have an awful lot of these because we didn't need them. And the government over the past year, 18 months actually, have been working hard to get more customs agents in place. But, um, you know, do start looking now if you haven't got something in place for this. But one thing I would point out to you here and now, even if you do use a third party to do the customs entries for you, you are responsible for the information on that entry. So you need to understand um, what information is required um, so that you can provide your freight forwarder or your customs agent with the information they need. So the sort of information that you would need to supply, um, the, the customs entry has got 54 boxes to complete. And as you can see from here, I'm not going through every one of those 54 boxes. I'm just looking at the salient ones that actually have a direct impact on the amount of VAT and duty that's paid. Um, a very important one is an HS tariff code or Customs Commodity Code um, that, that will define how much duty um, you have to pay. So you need to make sure you've selected the right one that adequately describes your, your product. Um, the INCO term that you've contracted to use with your um, supplier or your buyer. Again, hopefully all of you will know what INCO terms are. Um, again, I've got a couple of slides of those coming up. The country of origin of the product becomes important because it could be that there are specific preferences or restrictions depending on the country of origin. Um, you will need to provide the invoice value, the, the currency of the invoice um, to, the, uh, to the third party. You will need a customs procedure code uh, for the shipment. Um, there are lots of um, customs procedure codes, um, but effectively, if I just were to tell you that Generally, if you're doing a permanent um, export, that means that you're sending those products overseas, you're not expecting them back. There will be a CPC code of one, uh, six zeros, one. If you're permanently importing the product into the UK, you know, you're expecting for it not to go back. The code for that would be four um, and six zeros. 
But if um, you're just having things into the country temporarily and they're going back, or if you're sending things out of the country temporarily and they're coming back to you, there are different customs procedure codes. And that will have an impact on how HMRC deal with your particular import and how much due to the charge you. If you happen to have, if your goods are um, hazardous, considered hazardous, so they're flammable or poisonous, have a high combustion rate, that sort of thing, uh, you will also need uh, the UN code for that particular product, um, which also goes on the customs entry. So they're the salient points. As I say, there are other boxes, um, but they're the ones that you really need to be all over and understand. Um, so to reiterate at the moment, um, we don't have to pay any duties um, on goods coming and going from the EU. If we have a hard Brexit and no free trade agreement, we'll trade on what they call WTO rules, which is World Trade Organization rules, which means that basically uh, products will have a percentage duty charged on them. Obviously, that has an impact on your cost base if you're buying or your customer's cost base if you're selling. Um, so, you know, it, it would be as well for you to check what those duty rates would be. Um, should they come in, should we not have a free trade agreement with the EU. At the minute, um, unfortunately, there are two um, areas you can go and collect uh, this information from. From the 1st of January, there'll be um, a new tariff, um, which is effectively a manual of all the customs commodity codes with details of the duty chargeable. And that's a UK global tariff. And there's a link there for you to um, have a look there. And that will replace the EU customs tariff that we're using at the moment. Um, let me just go into the next stage and I'll just clarify that a little bit more. Um, if you're importing from the EU, um, if you're a buyer um, and you want to check what the duty charge will be um, post the 31st of January, I suggest that you'd have a look at the first link, um, which, which is a UK global tariff link. There, you will uh, put in your tariff code for your product and it will tell you what the current duty rate is right now and what the duty rate will be after the 31st of December. Um, as it happens, the government has reduced an awful lot of the duty charges. You know, they're aware that businesses need to be competitive um, and they're aware that businesses are going to have an awful lot to do that they haven't had to do previously. So they're sort of trying to sweeten it for us. Um, but at the minute, that's all it's showing, the current duty rate and the new duty rate come um, the 1st of January. If you wanted to find out um, what any, if, if there are any import restrictions on your product or any import um, preferences on your product, I suggest you use the other um, link, which is on the exporting side. That shows the current duty rate that EU countries charge um, for goods uh, coming into their country. Um, and it will also show any quotas, any restrictions. Um, and eventually, of course, we'll just move on to the one UK global tariff, but at the minute, not all the information has been transferred across. When you see how much duty your customer might have to pay in the EU, you might want to consider um, either paying it for them, if you can afford to, or meet them halfway and saying you'll pay a certain amount. I know I, I've got a particular client, they know they've got very strong competition in the EU and they know that their particular customers can go down the road to buy from uh, com competing suppliers where they won't have any duty to pay, where they won't have any documentation to supply. So they're trying to make it as um, attractive as possible to stay with them and they have actually made the decision that they will pay any duty that becomes chargeable. Obviously that depends on your margins but you know, it's something you might want to consider in order to be, to be able to keep your EU buyers. Um, so the tariff codes, basically it's, it's a unique number. Um, you'd go onto the um, tariff manual um, and it's a process of elimination. You can search by actual tariff code if you know what the tariff code is, or you can put a product description in and then you just go through those descriptions until you find one that is, um, a close, the closest match to your product. And at the side of it, it will tell you what the import duty is for that particular product. Um, 
just to make you aware, that standard rate of duty varies around the world. Although we've got a harmonized system where um, 250 countries around the world actually subscribe to the system and the majority of the um, customs codes are exactly the same, they are allowed to charge different duty rates uh, at the point of import. So if you don't already have tariff codes for your goods, please do start looking for them now. Um, you may be a sort of company that's only got two or three products, so you might only need two or three commodity codes. Uh, I mean, the company I worked for when I was a shipping manager, we probably had about 40 commodity codes because we had different types of products that we were exporting. Uh, but don't wait until the 1st of January because you know, you'll be getting a call from the freight forwarder or the haulier or the port or the airport wanting this information from you. So, so do do it now. And again, note that you're legally responsible for that customs commodity code. Um, so I wouldn't be letting a freight forwarder choose a commodity code for me. You know your products, you know what the uh, description of it is, and you can you are best placed to um, define what tariff code you should be using. Also bear in mind, if your freight forwarder, for example, got the wrong tariff code, um, you could be paying less, uh, sorry, more duty if you were uh, if you're importing than you actually needed to, and your buyer, if you're exporting, could be paying more than they needed to or less. Uh, so you, you, you really need to nail it. Um, once you've got that code, um, you will see that the tariff gives you information about the amount of duty to be paid, which we've already covered. Um, it could be that there's um, duty suspended for a period of time on your particular product, so you don't have to pay any at all. It will tell you if there's any physical quota on the goods that you need to import. Again, I wouldn't be expecting that in the short term from the EU, but it's something that could come in. You'd find out if there are any preferential duty rates that were applicable to your product. And it would also give you an idea whether you need an import license um, um, to get goods into the country, or even whether you might need an export license to get them out. Um, there are additional duties as well that uh, the government occasionally um, uh, levies on goods, effective known as anti-dumping or countervailing duties, where it becomes apparent that countries outside, um, suppliers in countries outside of the UK are selling to us at less than um, market rate. So in order to make our um, UK market a level playing field, they'll add extra duties on so that our manufacturers aren't um, inconvenienced by that. So note, if you do classify your goods incorrectly, uh, you can be asked to pay any outstanding duty or VAT that's been underpaid because of it. And they can ask you to do that for the past three years. Um, and whilst you're doing that, they'll delay your goods at the port. So all I'm saying is I'm encouraging you to, to, to find that tariff code that most closely meets your uh, product description. Right, in code terms, I mentioned this. This is another important part of the information that goes on to the customs entry. Um, for those of you who might not know what an INCO term is, it's something like, you'll, you'll probably have heard the term XWorks, FOB, CIF, CIP. They are your INCO terms. At the minute we're on, the version we're on is INCO terms 2020. Uh, and basically they define um, where the risk, the cost and the responsibility in the transport, jo transport journey from supplier to buyer, passes from seller to buyer. So who does what? on that journey, who's responsible for what, who's paying the cost for what. Um, and you may already have uh, found out that some of your EU suppliers or your EU customers are asking for a change in, in your INCO term um, because they don't particularly want to be doing any of the uh, particular responsibility tasks or costs in that, um, that journey. Again, I, I mean, I do a half day course on INCO terms, so obviously I'm not gonna be able to go into these in a stack of detail, but. If you were to look at that table there and you were to break down the journey uh, from supplier to buyer, there are various stages. So obviously your goods are ready, you ring somebody up to come and collect them. They collect from your premises, take them to the port or airport or a depot. At that point, they have to be customs cleared. The minute, not for the EU, but from the 31st of December, they will need to be. So there's a, a task there. Somebody's got to arrange for those goods to be customs cleared. Somebody's got to pay for those goods to be customs cleared. There will be export terminal handling charges. Then there will be the sea freight, air freight or road freight getting it from the supplier to the buyer. Once it arrives in the country of destination, an import customs clearance 
um, document will need to be raised again. That's got to, going to cost somebody. That's a task to be done. There will be import terminal handling charges. Then there'll be payments of import duty and taxes. Onward transit from the point of arrival to your buyer or if you're the buyer to you. And then in the background, of course, does anybody want to insure it? So if, for example, at the moment you were um, selling goods on an ex works basis to your EU customer, that means that they're having to arrange all of this. At the minute, there's not much to arrange. They just pick up a phone, send somebody to come and collect it, pay for the freight. No documentation to do, no customs entries to do. So it's not a big job for them. If on the 31st of December, you're still, still selling to some other th um, on X Works. They'll have all this to do, and they may feel as though, well, actually, it's too much for us to do. We don't know what we're doing. We don't want to pay for it. We don't want the um, administration involved in it. So, as I say, you may well find that people are asking you right now to um, reconsider the INCO term. Again, as I say, the INCO term appears on the customs entry, and duty and VAT is charged on the CIF value of your goods. That's not to say you've got to sell on CIF, uh, but customs and excise will look at the documentation that you provide. If it says X works, they will add on an amount to make it up to CIF uh, to, uh, to charge you on that CIF value. So it's important that that INCO term is also nailed um, before the 31st of December. Uh, moving on to the regulatory side of, of things um, and looking at the import side. So if you are a, a, a buyer, you're buying from the EU. Um, our government's decided uh, for a limited period of time to allow goods to come into the country that meet EU regulations. So you won't have to do anything different uh, initially. Um, it's been muted that by, you've got a year, by the end of 2021, um, that will no longer be the case. And at that stage, a new conformity mark's coming in called the UKCA conformity mark. Uh, now this is um, predominantly for manufactured goods. So the sort of goods that are usually marked with a CE mark. Um, and it's not a blanket um, uh, allowance, if you like. So I've put a link in there for you that you can go away at the end of this to have a look at uh, any other manufactured goods that might have a specific requirement. Uh, but in general, uh, you've got a year really for manufactured products. Um, if, however, you're importing any of the um, products here, so animal, plants, food and agriculture, chemicals, control goods, which are these military or so-called dual use goods, um, then there are specific uh, requirements for those. And again, I've put you a link there so you can go and have a look at what those specific requirements are. Um, the other thing, of course, you can do if you're a member of a trade association or if you know that your um, sector has a trade association, you can get in touch with them and see if they can give you any help on, on in this area. As far as exports is concerned, so if you are exporting to the EU, um, unfortunately, the EU uh, Parliament isn't according us the same period of, of grace to accept our goods um, for a period of a year um, as being compliant. From midnight, their time on the 31st of December, our goods will no longer meet their EU standards. Whether they do or not, I mean, nobody's gonna be changing standards overnight, that is a fact. But at midnight on the 31st of December, we become that third country, and therefore they're gonna expect us to um, provide documentary proof that our goods comply with EU standards. Um, if you have already got um, uh, an assessment for your product and it's been assessed by a UK body, what you will need to do is ask that UK assessment body whether they've transferred that information to a UK recognised conformity assessment body. And if they haven't, they need to be doing. Uh, and if they haven't and won't, you can look for an EU recognised body on this so-called Nando database. So again, there's a link for you. And on that link for your particular industry sector, you can um, find out um, a, a conformity assessment agency who you can transfer your assessment records to. Um, as far as automotive, aerospace, 
um, pharmaceutical, medical and chemicals, they have separate um, arrangements, unfortunately. And there are a couple of links there for you to have a look at if you're in that particular sector. Um, VAT. Um, there's not an awful lot change around VAT, but I thought I perhaps ought to um, just look at it so that you can gain some reassurance. Um, if you're a VAT registered company, um, you are allowed um, to, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do the purchase. I'm sorry, I've gone off piste here. I'm looking at export at the moment. We're talking about import. Um, if you're a VAT registered company, you've got to uh, pay UK VAT when goods arrive in the UK. Um, and you account for any VAT due on your VAT return currently for the EU. Um, an advantage uh, to try and make things easier and to sweeten the pill of um, uh, post-Brexit um, rules and regulations is if you also import from countries outside of the EU, whereas previously you would have had to have paid your duty in VAT before you took delivery of the goods, they're now allowing you to um, account for your VAT on your VAT return for the rest of the world imports as well. So that might be making you a, uh, your, your life a little bit easier if you do import from anywhere else other than the EU. Uh, you can, of course, reclaim your VAT as input tax, uh, subject to the usual accounting rules. Uh, you will need a C79 certificate um, in the background to do that. You're not necessarily asked to submit that certificate, but um, you'll be sent that certificate uh, to prove that the VAT has been uh, paid at the point of import and therefore you're allowed to claim it back. Um, that's on the import side of things. As far as VAT um, and you exporting, so what your uh, EU customer will have to do, um, if you are uh, VAT registered and your customer is VAT registered, you can um, zero rate your exports um, and VAT is then charged at um, in the importing country at the local rate in that importing country. If you have customers who aren't VAT registered then you're obliged to charge the UK rate of VAT so 20% um, and then that sells treated as a UK domestic supply for VAT purposes. Um, do remember though that when you do zero rate goods you're effectively not charging or even paying any VAT on those products. So you've got to get evidence that those goods have actually been exported. If you were to have a VAT audit and um, HMRC came into your premises and looked at your invoices and they'd find an invoice with no VAT on it, um, you could say, well, yes, obviously, we've not charged VAT on that because it's gone out of the country. Uh, there's the address it's gone to, and it'll be a, an address outside of the UK. That won't be enough for HMRC. They need actual proof that goods have left the country. Um, so do make sure you've got proof that goods have left the country and you've got to get that in place within three months of the actual departure. So the sort of evidence of removal um, will have to show details, such as obviously who you are, who your customer is, what the goods are, what the value is, what method of transport, uh, you use to get them out of the country and where the goods are going to, if not to the um, invoice address. Um, HMRC will accept a, pretty much an audit trail of um, the life of that order. Um, so you can show them a copy of your customer's order, you can show them your invoice, you could show them uh, your customer's payment, um, you know, proving that you've got payment for that particular amount on that particular invoice. But one thing that will trump all of those things would be uh, your freight forward as proof of export. So an airway bill, uh, a bill of lading or um, a certificate of shipment, CMR certificate of shipment, that your freight forward is sent to you as proof that goods have left the country. So hang on to that. Um, you need to hang on to that for a period of six years so that you've got proof that, yes, I did zero rate this. I'm not doing you. And here's the reason I did zero rate it. It's gone out of the country and here's the proof. Okay then, so what about if there is a free trade deal? What extra pain will that bring? Um, I mean, there'll be pain and, and delight, I think, actually. So at the minute, we are, the government's trying to negotiate a free trade deal, um, and that's with the aim of getting 
um, duty-free access to as many um, of our products as possible. Generally, um, it's um, industrial goods that get, that get a free pass first of all, but they're trying to get sort of um, other services, etc., in that free trade deal. Um, and ideally, in that free trade negotiation, negotiation, they're also hoping to maintain access to those other free trade agreements that we've got access to with other countries around the world. Um, just to bang that particular drum, it could be that if you are exporters to countries outside of the EU that we have got a free trade agreement with, that means that your customer, say in South Korea, we've got a free trade agreement with South Korea, if you provide proof that the goods originate, your South Korean customer can get your product into their country free of duty. As it happens, our government has rolled over that free trade agreement with South Korea. But if it was to another country where that um, free trade agreement hasn't been rolled over, your exports to that other country where there's no free trade agreement will suddenly find that they've got a duty chargeable. Again, you might be getting complaints from other customers around the world if, if that happens. So the current sticking points on the free trade negotiation are the um, services sector, so financial services sector and um, agriculture and fisheries. Um, that, that's a very sensitive area for the United Kingdom. But as I say, I think we must be very close because they have extended um, the negotiation period for a month to try and um, come to some sort of agreement on those areas. Um, however, it's not a panacea for everything, that free trade agreement. Yes, it would mean that um, duties are removed um, for goods coming into the country from the EU and goods going out of the country to your customers in the EU. Fantastic, that's a, a real big win. But it won't mean that there are no longer any border controls. You will still need a customs entry, regardless of whether we have a free trade agreement or not. And you will still need to prove that your, that your, your products do conform with EU uh, regulations and standards. And in addition to that, there'll be an extra document uh, that you need to prove that, uh, sorry, produce that proves that those products actually do originate in the UK. And that's not just a finger up in the air, sort of a, um, a, a judgment where you can say, well, actually we added 51% of the value to that product, therefore it originates. There are very specific criteria put in place that you, your product's got to meet. So there's, there's a raft of due diligence behind that that you'll have to do as well. So unfortunately that is extra work. It is generally a one-off, once a year piece of due diligence. And once you've done it, you can freely supply this certificate of preferential origin. I will say that because we've got 40 years worth of experience with the EU, you know, we've been a member state for 40 years or over actually, I think, um, we are trying to get um, a very specific free trade agreement. And it could be that the amount of due diligence is reduced. It could be that there's some other smart way that you can uh, produce that proof without having to produce a certificate. But as it stands at the moment, that's the way these things normally work. Um, so the sort of extra documentation you'll probably be need to supplying, maybe a UK certificate of, or of origin. Some, some of your customers might want to know that um, where the actual origin of the goods come from. At the moment, you might be asked to produce an EU certificate of origin. Obviously, if we're not an EU member state, we can't produce an EU certificate of origin. So we'll, we'll produce a UK certificate of origin, which uh, I understand is gonna look exactly the same as an EU one, but it just says UK rather than EU. If we do a free trade agreement in place, you'll be asked to present this movement certificate or preferential certificate. At the minute, that certificate's an EU R1. Um, it may be the same, it may have a different name, I don't know. Um, for certain types of products, you may be asked to supply certificates of conformity or health for that product. And again, for certain types of products, maybe an import license or an export license. And for sure, um, whatever, there'll be an export customs entry if you are selling to the EU and an import customs entry if you are buying from the EU. Um, sorry, I forgot to tell you that the term for the customs entry is a C88. It's, you would ask for a C88 document 
or a sad, um, and it is very sad as you might imagine with all those boxes to complete, uh, it stands for single administrative document. Um, I just thought perhaps I ought to include Northern Ireland. Um, I don't know if any of you trade with Northern Ireland at the moment, but of course it's the whole Irish question as it's been termed. Uh, just a tiny bit of background on that. Uh, when we do finally leave on the 31st of December, um, Northern Ireland will be in a unique position um, and it's all down to the Good Friday Agreement, which many of you may remember. Um, because of the troubles between North and South, um, the Good Friday Agreement worked to remove any sort of border between North and South because the border was a focal point for violence um, you know, the Southern Irish don't want the Northern Irish in place and vice versa. They don't want the country split in two, therefore they didn't want, uh, they, they, they would concentrate lots of their attacks on the border. So at all costs, um, it's statutory law in both the EU and the UK that there should be no border between North and South Ireland. Um, so that means, because they're trying to enshrine that, that means that goods that are traded between North and South um, in Ireland won't be subject to any custom duty, won't be subject to any border checks, um, and basically Northern Ireland will align to EU product standards and, and rules. If Northern Ireland sells to Great Britain, we won't have to pay any duty on those goods when they come into, the UK, into Great Britain. Um, but the Northern Irish company will have to uh, do a simplified export declaration. If you as a company sell to Northern Ireland, fortunately, you may be asked for some sort of certificate of compliance, because of course we'll be looking at EU standards rather than UK standards. An import entry will have to be done by your customer um, at their end, and duty at an EU rate will be charged on your product unless the buyer can prove that those goods will be staying in Northern Ireland. If there's any chance of those goods going to Southern Ireland, then that duty will be charged. Um, again, if you've been keeping up to date with this, and I mean, there's been so much going on in the news, hasn't there recently, what with COVID and Brexit, um, there's been all the kerfuffle recently about the government saying that they uh, might not adhere to some of the points of the agreement everybody's gone up in arms, um, everybody thinks it's a negotiating tool, um, but um, clearly it wouldn't be a good thing for any future trade agreements uh, with any other countries that we might want to do a free trade agreement with, if we suddenly rip up a piece of paper and say actually we're not going to do that. So everybody's hopeful that it is a negotiating um, ruse, um, but effectively, I suppose what the government's trying to do is remove as many regulations um, between Northern Ireland and the rest of Great Britain as possible. Um, again, just a heads up, you don't have to do any of this, but I just want to make you aware that if you do a lot of importing um, and you want to legally avoid paying duty in VAT. There are what they call special customs procedures out there that you can subscribe to. Um, and that's not all of them, but it's the um, most widely used ones. Um, basically, for example, if you were buying um, a product from a, an EU supplier and they want to send you some samples, um, if provided they were marked as samples, you could apply for it to come into the country when you do your customs entry as a temporary admission. And you would present them with a, a, a different CPC code. You know, I mentioned at the beginning a CPC code. Um, and that would mean that you didn't have to pay any duty or VAT on those because um, those goods were gonna be destroyed when you'd finished with them. If you're a company that does processing, um, so you, uh, an EU supplier might use you to, to do some processing on their product and you return it to them. Um, why would you have to pay a duty on that product coming in? It's not yours, it's going back. So you'd apply for an inward processing. If you're a company that sends your product out to the EU uh, for further processing and then they send it back to you after it's been processed. Again, why pay duty on the original, excuse me, on the original product? You may have to pay duty on the added value when it comes back into the country, but not on the whole of it. That's out of processing. 
And if you're a company that imports a lot from the EU, but a lot of it is then re-exported, you can set up a customs warehouse, whereby, again, duty and VAT is suspended until you prove that those goods have gone out of the country and then it's discharged of. And if you're a, an exporter and you supply goods to an EU customer and they return that for some reason, it's defective or they don't want it anymore. If you don't tell Customs and Excise at the point of entry into the UK that it's your product coming back, they'll charge a duty on it. Again, why would you pay duty on your own product coming back? Flag it up to them, give them a different CPC code and you avoid duty on that. And if as a, an importer, sorry, I know there's a stack of information here, I do apologize, but I'm trying to cover lots of bases for you. If as an importer, um, some goods come into the uh, country from your supplier, when you open them, there's something wrong with them. So you reject them, you send them back, you can reclaim that import duty back uh, as a rejected import. For some of these special procedures, you have to have a financial guarantee in, in place. Um, and not all of them, but some of them. Um, and that may well be um, a price worth paying in order to legally avoid that duty and VAT in those circumstances. So your takeaway to-do list really, um, if you haven't already got an EORI number, get one quickly. Um, it won't take long, it doesn't cost anything. Find out what your tariff um, number is and what the tariff rate is for your product. Um, you know, you might want to find out if there's, if there's no free trade agreement in place, how much extra is it gonna cost you to buy from the EU? I'm not saying that every product has um, a duty charged in it. Some products have a nil rate of duty, but some have 2%, 5%. The, the highest duty rate actually is something like 80%. That's for pro processed beef. Why, I don't know, but that's what you're looking at. The majority in the 2% to 25% range. Um, again, you might want to find out how much your EU customer might be paying on your product if you're selling it to them. Um, so that you've got some sort of idea of what impact um, a hard Brexit has on them. Um, if as an exporter you promise delivery dates, um, you might want to allow extra time for possible border delays. When you think about those 10,000 lorries coming through Dover or going back out through Dover, they're just going through at the moment, no checks whatsoever. Um, given that uh, there's gonna be customs entries to be done, on the 1st of January, obviously those trucks aren't going to be going through as quickly as possible. So it could be that you might want to add a couple of days onto your delivery dates. If you're part of a just-in-time supply chain uh, where you depend on goods coming to you quickly from the EU, again, you might want at this point to start thinking, actually, do I want some more stock in place? Um, I remember reading an article that just blew my mind about Jaguar Land Rover here in the UK. And their supply chain is so slick that they only use um, hold two hours worth of stock, um, which is absolutely astonishing in my book. Uh, but again, going back to that Dover example, um, that two hours of stock isn't gonna be enough, is it, if there are gonna be uh, lorries stopped for customs checks. Um, do research um, whether the product you buy from an EU supplier or the product you sell to an EU customer will need any sort of compliance certification in place familiarise yourself with what that is, understand what document you've got to um, provide, um, understand the basis of the customs value of goods at import. So I talked about customs duty being um, charged on the CIF value. You need to know how that's made up. Um, obviously, if you don't know of any of these things, I'm hopeful that a lot of you will I mean, many of you may already be exporting and importing from the rest of the world, so a lot of this won't be new to you. Um, but if you don't know any of this, get your staff trained up. You know, knowledge is power. It will help you come the 31st of December. Um, have a look at that customs entry. Understand the information that you're going to have to supply. Um, to, to my mind, the best way of supplying that information is to make sure it's on your commercial invoice. And then all you've got to do is supply your commercial invoice to your freight forwarder and they can pick that information off your commercial invoice. Uh, check that your freight forwarder is ready. Um, check that they can do a customs entry for you. Um, 
if you do import from free trade agreement countries or do export free trade agreement countries, so the ones that we're part to at the moment, um, consider those supplies and dispatches. If we don't get a free trade agreement, uh, you might want to consider um, registering for a duty deferment account. That basically means that instead of paying duty at the point of import, duty and VAT at the point of import, um, you can defer it by 30 days and that can help with cash flow. Um, that might be important to you. And don't forget to consider the impact of the INCO term with your EU supplier and your EU buyer. And that, my dears, is it. Uh, as I say, there's, a, there's an awful lot to take in. I'm sure many of you will uh, be all over it already. Um, but, you know, this webinar really was to um, uh, give you a, a final look at the sorts of things that you really ought to be looking at right now and to give you the chance after this um, session to go back to your office, to go back to your business and consider, well, have we got that? Are we all right? just so that when the 31st of December comes, your first import or your first export isn't going to be stuck somewhere because you aren't ready. Uh, and again, I'm not saying that it's going to be really smooth sailing uh, right from the very beginning. And if you are ready, I think there will be delays in the short term. But, you know, you need to make yourself as ready as possible um, so that it isn't as painful as it could be. OK, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jane. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I think businesses have got a, a lot to understand, unfortunately, in terms of where we're going to be on the 1st of January. And, and, and for me, you've answered a lot of questions. Having said that, I'm sure there are lots of questions. So I, I'd like to move on to that section uh, of the training, the webinar now, if that's okay. And I know there's a couple of questions that have just popped in the chat box, but I've just got a question to start with, if that's okay, Jane. And it's yeah, probably not a simple answer, so I apologise for putting you on the spot. But what what do you see as maybe the the biggest two or three challenges that businesses are going to face come first of Jan? And I appreciate all industries might be have little or or a lot of different challenges, should I say? But where do, where do you see the biggest uh, challenges? Um, I think to be honest, it's it's going to be around the documentation, um, especially if you've only been used to trading with the EU. If you are used to trading with the rest of the world, a lot of what I've been talking about, you'll be used to. Um, but if you've only been trading with the EU, it's going to come as a bit of a shock, the amount of information you've got to supply, uh, the documentation you've got to supply. Uh, and, and certainly that customs entry, as I say, that is a definite, regardless of free trade agreement, that customs entry is a definite. And your freight forwarder, hopefully, will be totally OK with it. Um, but as I say, it's the information that you provide on that customs entry that will impact on um, the duty and VAT um, that's paid by you as an importer or by your customer um, in the EU. Uh, and delays, I suppose, is the other one. I, I know, I, well, I read reports. Uh, I don't know for sure. I've not got any insider knowledge on this. Um, because the UK government realises what a huge impact it's going to have on, on international trade um, and, and, and importers here and exporters here. Certainly goods coming in, they're gonna wave through as many as possible as they, as they can. You know, we've all heard about these parts of motorways in Kent that are gonna be made into car parks. Uh, obviously they want to avoid that. So as, as much as possible, certainly in the short term, they're gonna be waving through as much as they possibly can. Um, but as I say, if you've got your ducks in a row, if you've done everything you can at your side, then the only things that you're going to be really worried about is the, is the delay side of things. Okay, thanks, Jane. And we've also had a question put in the chat box from uh, the, the account of uh, R-A-T-A-J-001. Uh, Do you want to just unmute yourself and ask that question? Uh, equally, I can read it out. That's no problem at all. But you might get your point across a little bit better if you want to unmute yourself and ask that question. No, nope, so I'll read it out instead. So what is your view on vehicle registration requirements? At the moment, dealing with WTO countries, we need to sub, uh, submit vehicle reg numbers for export declaration. I uh, cannot see this possible after Brexit, the way the uh, road freight is structured in the UK. Uh, direct shipment are easy to deal with, but we have plenty handling uh, depot in UK before goods exit UK. 
how do you know in advance that vehicle number? Uh, how do we know in advance what vehicle number to submit? Does that make sense to you, to you, Jane? Sorry, no. Are we talking about from a, a freight forwarder's point of view, where the um, you're talking about vehicle registration number for the freight forwarders to get into Europe, or are we talking about exporting vehicles? Is it, the part on there? It's from the shipper. The shipper's point of view, exporting goods. Uh, yeah, I don't have any experience of that, um, but you can on, on one of my previous slides. Uh, there was a link, um, a website link, that was specifically about vehicles, and there's a whole section on that. I personally haven't been involved in that in my career. Um, so if you find that particular link um, and go to it, I'm sure that um, a lot of that will be explained to you. Um, if we're talking about transit and freight forwarders at the minute, um, because we're part of the Common Transit Convention, it means that any haulier or freight forwarder in this country can freely uh, travel around the EU. Uh, they may be um, talking about that. Uh, if that is what they're talking about, then they need to get a transit permit um, in place uh, to be able to go through each individual country in advance. So they need a transit permit for each country. Sure. And the links that you, you provided in the presentation, Jane, if we can have access to them, then we can share them on the follow up email as well, if that's OK with you. Yeah. So other people in the call can see that as well. Is that all right? Yeah, absolutely fine. Brilliant. Yeah. Is, there, is there anybody else that wants to ask a question? Please feel free to unmute yourselves and, and ask Jane directly. That's no problem at all. Hello, Jane. I've got a quick question. Yeah. Are we, are we classing couriers as freight forwarders, such as DHL and UPS? Because yeah. 95% of what we, uh, we, we make, we, we sell into Europe, and yeah. we heavily use DHL, so I'm assuming, other than the EORI number uh, and a VAT deferment account, nothing will really change from our point of view as DHL take care of the, the customs entries? Yeah, so um, the couriers are known as fast parcel operators, and they've got fantastic systems, um, clearly, because the idea is to get goods as quickly as possible from you to your, your buyer, they've yeah. got really slick systems in the background. Uh, of course, the minute they won't be used to doing customs entries for Europe, but um, certainly I'm working with UPS at the moment. I know they're getting um, those systems up and running. Um, you will still though, uh, Nick, need to make sure you've got the right tariff codes. Yeah. Um, so that the right amount of duty is charged. You don't want your customer paying too much, for example. Um, and, and a lot of the other, um, things are still relevant to you but yes your your fast parcel operator will be automatically doing customs entries for you yeah, yeah that's great. You, you might find the price goes up um, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely thank you jane okay uh, jane we've also had a, a a question in the chat box from uh, jackie blakesley uh, we are an approved exporter does this help with customs etc no um if you're an approved exporter Oh, let me get this right. Yeah, that means um, for free trade agreement countries, um, rather than do an EUR1 certificate, uh, a physical document to send with your products uh, when you export to those particular countries, you just have an approved exporter number and um, a statement that you put in your invoices. Uh, that basically means you've done your due diligence around that free trade agreement. Um, so no, it doesn't really give you any advantage with the um, EU. Something else that you can consider going forward is to become an AEO, which is an authorised economic operator, something completely different. Um, that's, um, again, quite a big project. Um, but basically, if you can become an AEO, it shows to Customs and Excise that you know what you're talking about, you uh, understand all the aspects of the customs entry um, and that will mean that your goods will go through customs and excise. It, they, they won't be um, checked because they know that you know what you're talking about. They know that you're compliant. Uh, so going forward, becoming an AEO would be a, a good thing to, to do. Uh, that's something as well that we can help you with at, at, the, at the chamber. Um, it, it's a free of charge process, but the... Um, Terminology, unfortunately, with HMRC, it's like reading a foreign language. So very often we found that members have needed help with that. And that's a service we offer 
Um, and also we, we can audit your systems in, in advance to increase the chance of you getting that particular status. Brilliant, thanks Jane. I'm just gonna to come to Louise Clark very, very quickly. Uh, Louise Clark is our, uh, is my colleague at the Chamber who looks after you guys with my colleagues, Laura, Sue and Nikki around the export documentation. Uh, Louise, is there something you'd like to add? Just that we are gonna become customs brokers. We're going through the process at the moment. So by January, we will also be able to do customs declarations for anybody who requires that. Um, obviously, as soon as we've got this ready, but before the end of this year, anybody who is interested in that would be able to get you all signed up and everything, be able to do that. I think the DHL that you mentioned earlier, they do do their own and they they actually only allow themselves to do it, I believe, the DHL, but for anybody else, you'd be happy to do that. Brilliant. Thanks, Louise. So if there, are, if there are no more questions, then what we'll do is we'll, we'll close the event there. But a big thank you to Jane uh, for uh, everything that you've gone through over the last hour, Jane. We really appreciate that. The okay. next online event throughout this uh, Brexit contingency programme is on the 15th of October, starting at 9.30. That's going to be done virtually once again. Uh, we will send a link out for that uh, when we do the follow-up email following on from this from this webinar. So you'll hear from William Beckett on there, the chairman of the International Trade Forum, and Jenny Lawson from the Enterprise Europe Network. Uh, and they're gonna be talking about the latest updates of the Brexit negotiations uh, and ensure that you're ready for the end of the, obviously the EU transition. There'll also be another live Q&A on there as well. Uh, so you can alleviate any concerns, questions, queries, etc. So we'll circulate that link on, on, on the follow-up email. Alternatively, it is on our website if you wanna have a look straight on there. So, uh, oh, just looking back, uh, we, we have uh, had a question saying, will we get sent a copy of the slides from today? You won't get a necessarily a copy of the slides, but what we will do is we will send you the recording of this so you can recap and show colleagues as well. That's the best thing that we can do on that. Unless Jane, you want to say any different on that? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, I can provide the copy of the slides if you want. And just to say as well, I mean, my, my email address is there. If you've got any feedback, um, do let me know. It's, it, I must admit, this webinar um, format is quite sterile, um, and I love to hear your feedback. I love to hear about your um, circumstances. So, if you've got any question that I've not answered, or you were too shy to ask uh, here, you know, feel free. Just just send me an email. And Jane, in a training facility, you would normally get a round of applause, I assure you. So we're all doing it virtually, <laughs> trust us, that's what we're doing for you. All right, thank you. <laughs> well, I just want to say thank you to everyone. Thanks for taking part today. And big thanks to Jane for spending the time to go through the information. And we'll send a follow-up email with the useful links on there and also the recording of the webinar for you guys to recap and show colleagues. But thanks for your time and take care. Cheers. Bye.